as I walked into this beautiful office, I saw a lot of people working away at their desks and focused and concentrated this amazing business that uh, has been created. We are at Petrochem. Petrochem was set up many years ago and we will talk to the founder. What is the DNA? What was the genesis of this company? How did it come about? How does it, how does it grow? Where does it go into the future? What kinds of challenges and opportunities that are there uh, with this company? We're going to be probing and sharing and, and understanding the core of this company, the heart of this company, and also the mind of the company. And I see it as a human being. This is Petrochem today, a leading light in the petrochemical industry, one of the leading companies in this region, and it is there at uh, you know at a global level. And Dubai is one of their hubs, which really pulls together this beautiful city that we are in behind us. Today, we are really fortunate to have the founder, the creator, the thinker behind this great company, and in the in the person of Yogesh Mehta, the founder and the CEO MD. Good to see you, Dalek. Yogi, can we take you back to day one, when the idea and the germ of the idea came into your head that we, you, you want to be in this business, in the petrochemical industry? How did it come about? Well, it came, <laughs> I think you'll take me back another 40 years. Okay. Um, I was very young, uh, less than 18 even, uh, when I started work with my father. My father, a PhD polymer chemist, had a small not very flourishing chemical business and he was uh, into manufacturing chemicals and I said what the heck I'm going to learn from him because uh, he uh, this was my family business and I thought I should learn from him and see where it goes. Um, I worked for him for about two and a half years and I decided that I should not do manufacturing because it didn't really make too much money. Uh, my forte was to be a salesperson so I thought that uh, let me go into sales and after two years working with him uh, under him and learning from him, I left and branched out and made my own company. And I was um, even less than 20 at that time. And I formed this chemical company, found one or two very gullible partners who gave me a few thousand rupees to set up my chemical business. And uh, <clears throat> in that journey, I was also uh, seeing my girlfriend. And there was a lot of pressure, you know, this is way back and many, many years um, when times were more traditional and conservative. and. Uh, my girlfriend's parents wanted somebody who was earning money and I made out as if I was earning money and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, started doing this chemical business and very soon, um, very soon I got married to my girlfriend and this small chemical business continued and it actually didn't do too well. Within two or three years of my marriage I lost all my money. I lost the money because I didn't do business uh, the way business is done. Um, and there were, it was, I was foolish and I was young and a fool and his money are soon parted. So this is what happened. And um, when I was about 25, uh, I had no money but a lovely wife and a lot of will, a lot of will to survive, a lot of will to create, a lot of will to come back and succeed. But the odds were against me or probably my time was not good. And um, <clears throat> I failed and failed. By this time, my son, uh, Rohan, was born. And uh, whilst the family life flourished, my financial life was actually down in the dumps. So um, going back, it started in when I was 18 years old. And by the time I was 28, I had finished my Indian journey, my Indian journey of lots of learning and very poor earnings. And um, come 28, when I was 28 years old, I decided that I would seek my fortune elsewhere. And uh, my friend who lived in Dubai at that time invited me and said, come to Dubai, I have an empty apartment and empty pockets, but you can stay with me and uh, let's you know, try your luck in Dubai. So I came to Dubai on a hope and a prayer and I think found my fortune in a few years. So in this journey when you came here, uh, one of the things was about the buy at an early stage. This was 1990, wasn't it? Yeah, it was 1990 and uh, Dubai at that time was a fishing village. And uh, I came here and, and I thought, I had actually burned bridges. I had no reason to go back to India because um, I owed some people some money and I owed a lot to my parents and my in-laws to make my, my career and to make a fortune or hopefully even survive. So uh, really I was not in a hurry to go back and I thought, 
the best way uh, to learn uh, to do what to do is to find out what goes on in the city. I wanted to do only chemicals. I know chemicals and I only wanted to do the chemical business. So I went to a library and there's the Dubai Municipal Library as they call it. And I would go there at 8 in the morning till 4 in the evening finding out what products, what chemical products come in Dubai or in the Middle East or in the GCC. And who are the players? Who buys here? Who sells here? What is consumed here? What quantity is consumed here? Luckily, the Dubai library had a lot of statistics. And I made a huge dossier and I made a business plan and said, OK, I'm going to do a chemical trading business. I'm going to start a chemical trading business, but I need a financial partner. So uh, it all, it all, I started and spread word as to I'm looking for a financial partner and uh, I have a great business plan. Few people believed me and most did not. One day I found a partner and um, I found a partner with a stroke of luck actually. And, uh, and he said, wow, well, you want to do chemicals? Very good. I also want to open a chemical business. So I joined him on June 6, 1990. And I became a small partner with this kind gentleman uh, who was very brave to allow me to be his partner. I have actually not looked back after that. What is your definition of luck? Yeah, I have uh, spoken a lot about luck because I actually attribute most of my, my good fortune to good luck. Good fortune, good luck, I understand that. My definition of luck is preparation and opportunity. And the crossover point between preparation and opportunity is luck. Because if you prepare, if you're not prepared, but you get the opportunity, you won't get it. And, and uh, if, you're, if you're prepared, but there is no opportunity, you won't get it. So you really need those two. And that's the crossover point. And that, you know, the harder you work, the luckier you get is one of my other quotes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, hard work and luck will go together, but you have to make your luck, which means that you have to have a skill set. You have to be in the right place at the right time. You can't say, oh, I have bad luck and I'm not going to get out of bed. You have to make your luck. Making luck means working hard, uh, having a skill set, having a business plan, and making it happen. And if you are keen to make it happen, I think fate and nature will allow you to, ha to, to seek your fortune, to make it happen for yourself. It's not going to, you're not going to get lucky, you're not going to get profitable, you're not going to get rich by just staying in bed. You need to get out of bed and work hard. Working hard is key to everything. You burnt your bridges in India, you came here. Why didn't you go and seek a job like most people would? So I come from an entrepreneur family and um, my mindset was such that I never ever wanted to work for somebody. And it, actually it was uh, my temperament. My temperament made me think, I always thought I'm going to be a rich tycoon. I'm going to be an industrialist. I'm going to be the king of all I see. And of course I was very young and hence I was foolish. Uh, but that foolishness helped me to achieve what I wanted. So really um, <clears throat> in my family, um, my father never worked for anybody and I thought that I should not work for anybody. And that always came. I never ever thought that I should do a job because I felt that I didn't have the temperament for it. So you were this uh, young, energetic entrepreneur and you started writing a business plan. What was in the business plan? How did you create it? Well, in my business plan, the number one thing was to create barriers to entry for competition. I wanted to have a business that nobody else had. I wanted to do a business that was at the right time, at the right place. I, I decided that the best way to do this is to find a niche. I said that let me find three or four products that are most in demand in the, in the, in the Middle East. And we found those products. And we said, okay, we're only going to do products that are, that are sort of, the, we call them specialty chemicals. And I started with that. Slowly, slowly, this, this basket improved and increased because our customers felt that, ah, your supply situation is good, your credentials are good, we'd like to buy more and more from you. So it's more about reputation. And uh, you know, the, the better your reputation, the better your prospects of doing business. And I, we achieved that very quickly because we gave good service, good quality, enough credit, and I think we were innovative enough uh, to go to the customer and give them more and more uh, products for their growing business. Bear in mind that we were at the right place at the right time. The UAE was growing, the Middle East was growing. So that gave us enough opportunities to present more products and more chemicals to our customers and hence the business grew from very little to too much. In the very early days, let's say the first two or three years, take us through your 
through your work journey and, and how, you, how you attracted people um, and incentivized people to join you. What was your story at that point in time? Well, you know, as, as we started our business, the biggest challenge was to find finance. And the banks were far and distant. Um, I've always learned that, you know, show a banker that you don't want his money and he will give it to you. So the more we, <laughs> we went to the banks and said, look, we have a great business plan and can we please have a credit line? And they said, well, you're too young and you all are too, uh, the business is too young and it has no, not much history. So actually finance was hard to find. And uh, for that, you know, we, we had to go to our suppliers and pay a little more money and get enough credit. But, you know, patience is the key. And as the business grew, our bankers became more fonder for us, of us. And uh, we performed uh, with no, you see, we performed in such a manner, our honesty and ethics were huge at that time. And the bankers said that, you know, you have a strong business case and the way you do your business is so wonderful. We will lend you more money. In fact, we'll become your partners. So finance was one. How about attracting talent? Yes, and there is no business uh, that is complete without proper talent. I think people make the company and the company really is nothing without the people it has. The glory and strength of Petrochem has always been its people. We've got some fine people working in our company and you know people who have started their careers in the company and haven't moved for the last 23 years. So um, acquiring talent is important, retaining talent is important. And that actually, you can retain talent if your ethics are good, if the company culture is good, if the company DNA is good. At Petrochem, talent is very, very important. I've always found that companies wither away if they don't have the right talent. Uh, we set about, even in the early days, we set about acquiring the right talent. Talent means people, recruiting the right people. We recruited people for attitude and aptitude. We didn't, re really, I didn't see the CV, whether he was a chemical engineer or she was a, uh, great um, performer, we saw the, the fire in the eye, the fire in the gut, and we hired such people. Young people, they were people who had a zest to work at Petrochem. And within two or three years, they even got the culture and the DNA of Petrochem. Today it's 23 years, and the same people are with us, and they're growing with us, and they're large families, uh, they have they've become part of our large family. So really, I'm actually very proud of our people, and I thank them, and I know that without these fine people at Petrochem, our company would be nowhere. You touched on a very interesting point here, is that you hired for attitude and aptitude, and you didn't really look at their CVs, and 25 years later, they are still here, and the loyalty is there, and they've developed and grown with you. As you develop them over these 25 years, what are the, some of the things that you were doing with them to become these great people? Because they started obviously young and they evolved and grew with you. What kind of training structures, what kind of developmental structures did you incorporate to make this into a great corporation? At first, when we hired people or we acquired talent, we always told them three things. This company has three very important aspects, love, respect, and integrity. When we recruited people, the first thing I would say to people, welcome to the world of Petrochem. And they would say, what? And, and they would say, oh, is this the world? Is it a different world? And I said, yes, the world of Petrochem is very, very different in that we love you, we respect you, and we believe in integrity. If we've shaken your hand, if you, we've brought you into our company, you are our family. These are humane things, these are emotional things, but they have helped us because I feel that the same people think that this company is really my company, is really my family, and I will give my life and sweat to make this company successful. So this is emotional intelligence. A lot of it is emotional intelligence, and you have to use that. It means, emotional intelligence means giving people what they want so that they can perform better and better for the company, and in the end, you get, as an entrepreneur, you get what you want. Getting into how the company built scale and how it built size, uh, because a lot of companies start and, uh, and people are generally quite confused of how do you get to from zero to ten and more importantly how do you get from ten to a hundred and then to a thousand and to a billion. Your curve has been superb uh, or exponential curve. How do you build exponential curves as a businessman? 
Well, you know, you must remember that uh, the markets were growing, the world was growing, we had the internet boom at that time. So rather than taking all the credit to Petrochem and myself, um, the landscape was very, very productive at that time. If you see the journey of companies from 1995 to 2008, it has been a huge journey for the entrepreneur, for the business. The world was growing, the China was growing, the Middle East was growing. Um, I think that the internet found a lot of opportunities for people and we cashed in on that. The internet boom really helped us. But in all of that, the constant was good ethics, good service, and continuous winning the confidence of our people. And the people means our consumers, our buyers, our principals. We were agents, we are agents for lovely, huge companies. And these, these companies have been with us for the last 23 years. They haven't gone away. They believe in the brand Petrochem. And I think that the brand Petrochem is thanks to the people at Petrochem. At no point can I actually ever tell you that this is a journey that I have achieved alone. It is thanks to the people at Petrochem. What are the values of brand Petrochem? So the brand Petrochem always resonates the three words, love, respect and integrity. But the biggest thing um, at Petrochem is that are we an honest company? Are we perceived to be an honest and ethical company? That is most important because the customer, be it a buyer or seller, must trust you and I have always said I have always done business with people that I can have dinner with whom I can bring home to and I can introduce my wife to I do not do business with people whom I've just met and I say right here's a hundred million dollar business and let's do it together I think that business is done out of great friendship and concern and care and then in this journey these very customers become your friends and they become your family. So that has actually been the biggest and most important part uh, for the success of Petrochem is that we have made our buyers and sellers and our customers part of the Petrochem family. How many people are there in the Petrochem family? The Petrochem family is uh, not very large. We are about 230 people worldwide. Uh, we have offices in China, in Taiwan, Singapore, London, Antwerp, Dubai is of course the head office and we have a large terminal in Egypt as well as in Jabal Ali in Dubai. Uh, Dubai continues to be our headquarter and uh, I sit in Dubai myself. Your company is valued in several billion dollars. Um, how do you, a small group of 200 and, or to 300 people, create so much value? <laughs> well, I think uh, it's thanks to um, the region, the Middle East region has flourished and we have grown along with it. Today, yes, our turnover is more than a billion dollars and uh, the valuation of the company, I hope, will be in hundreds of millions of dollars, but uh, uh, it's not really the valuation. Uh, we are here to get more value out of this company. We are here to grow this company for years and years together. I think that there's great potential in the market and in the strength of Petrochem. When you wake up in the morning, and you walk and you plan to come to the office and you walk through your office, what do you feel? I am always very excited in the morning to come to work. Uh, what drives me to work? Uh, I think it is the pursuit of success. The pursuit of meeting my family, my Petrochem family, which is my work family. Um, the pursuit of excellence. And I know it's a very cliche thing that I'm in pursuit of excellence. But really, when you've got a good thing going like a company like Petrochem, uh, I, I just feel that you know, I love to come to work, I love to generate new ideas, I love to make new deals, I love to make, meet the people in my company. Sincerely, I love to meet everybody in the company. Sometimes I'm just standing at, at their desk and just gossiping with them. And I really love that because these people, my, 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 the people in my company, they work for 10 hours, 12 hours a day. It is their home and I want them to feel at home. And I want them as a father, as, as the guiding father as I am, uh, I want to be there for them. And I sort of anchor these people and I sort of, they, they like me because I think they like me because when I'm away, they say, oh, we missed you, Yogi. So I think they like me. What advice do you give them in terms of uh, the way they focus on their work and how they can contribute? And, and, and I'd like to ask the advice in two forms, advice to them and advice to young people who are working in companies. Yes, in today's generations, the one thing that's missing is patience. Uh, people expect, you know, in, like instant coffee, they expect instant gratification, instant success. And uh, success will never come to you overnight unless you win a lottery. 
I think success comes from having a great business plan, from having good ideas, ethical ideas, from taking the right steps by aligning yourself. Success in business will come only if you are, are in a good mental space in your mind. Success will not come if you want to take shortcuts. I have seen people failing, companies falling because they've taken shortcuts. And I mean that when you say shortcuts, what does shortcut mean? That I, I think that there are no easy steps to success. I think there are no quick steps to success. You've come a long way in the last 25 years and you are at an amazing inflection point. There are only two things you can do. One is to cruise, in which case you probably will go down, and the other is really just to take off from here. What are you doing as a founder, as a thinker, and as a creator to take the company to the next level? I want to tell you that the landscape today has changed completely. It has become a hostile landscape. Uh, there is oversupply. China, the factory to the world, has oversupplied in such a manner that there is business is done when there's a demand and supply imbalance. Money is made when there's a demand and supply imbalance. There's a need for something and monies are made. In today's world, there is no shortage of any commodity, any luxury item. We lived in an oversupplied world. So oversupply means that my producer who supplies to me wants my business because he wants to go directly to my consumer. He, they, the company wants to go directly to my consumer. I feel that the business has become very, very hostile. And we really need to adapt. I asked my Harvard professor that I feel that this, the business in today's world has become very hostile and it's not the business it, um, it used to be. And he said to me, continue doing the business you do. Don't change the, your business, but change the way you do your business. So I think it is time to change the way we do our business at Petrochem. The new normal dictates lower margins. Um, we don't make the monies we used to. Uh, cost of living, cost of running companies has become higher and higher. So we have challenges right now. The challenges are lower margins, uh, oversupply, lots of competition, lots of unfair competition. So we lived in a very challenged world right now. And it never used to be so. And we lived in a very comfortable world. But I think that's life. It will bring challenges. It will bring new issues and new challenges. We must overcome them. What are the new opportunities that you see? I know we have challenges. What are the new opportunities? <laughs> I tell you really that there are not many opportunities in today's world. Uh, however, you may think that there's smart technology and innovation and, you know, the world has become smaller and smaller. But as the world becomes smaller and smaller, one feels that one has to adapt and find new skill sets. The skill sets of, of, the, of the previous years are not going to help. Um, I feel a little old and I feel a little old fashioned and I feel that I may have missed the bus somewhere because I think that the world has advanced too quickly and too much um, and, and a lot of people are lagging behind, possibly including me. Technology has uh, accelerated a lot of change. The way technology and information is shared now, a 25 year old is an extremely knowledgeable person, may not, may not have the experience, but highly knowledgeable. Um, and then supported by technology and, and other bits and pieces around it, com uh, cognitive computing and so on, it has access to a lot of capability. What advice do you give to these 25-year-olds that are coming out, brains full, <laughs> armed with technology, armed with ambition on both sides and they're going out there? What's your advice to these young people? The young generation has really um, advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is that they have too much information. And sometimes I think they have more information than they need. And sometimes I feel I have more information than I need. I have no time to be peaceful and quiet because I'm being continuously loaded with more and more information. Is all this information going to be useful for me or for this young generation? I don't know. I think that in the new generation, these people are smart, they are clever, they will have lots of new opportunities, but they'll have to work harder. Uh, our times were a little better. Work harder or work smarter with greater intelligence? You're right. Actually, working hard is not enough. They'll have to work smarter. We are now in the age of intelligence, so knowledge is a commodity, information is a commodity. So how do I, we use our brain to become smarter and apply intelligence to great new things? 
as the world evolves and changes and your industry and your company changes, uh, we are facing a fewer jobs in the future. We are facing a lower oil price in the future. We are facing no oil within our lifetimes. How does a company like Petrochem completely reinvent itself? And, uh, and what are your thoughts on that kind of reinvention when it comes to changing the complete company to a new future? Yeah, it's very true that Petrochem will have to reinvent itself because the new normal dictates that we re-strategize the business, we re-innovate the business. What we did in the last 10 years is not helping. Uh, it has become obsolete. I think that, you know, a very intelligent guy told me that the, if the competition of 10 years later is not even born today, so I may not know, we as a company will not know who's going to compete with us, with what speed they are going to compete with us, and with what elements they are going to compete with us. So Petrochem will have to continuously innovate. And, and that is not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing. We have to change with times. We have to adapt. And in this new adaption, adaptation, I think that we'll find new success. Yeah. I'm very optimistic. Yogi, you spoke about a new normal. We're living in a VUCA world volatility, uh, uncertainty, uh, complexity, and ambiguity all at the same time. This is our new normal. In this new normal, how do you come out and break away from the, uh, from, from the crowd? Well, you know, your past reputation will help you at first. Uh, Petrochem is known for good service, good ethics, and, and great products. So that is really going to help us. In, this, in, in the past, we've acquired a great reputation, but it will not be enough. We'll have to also get new skills. And we are continuously innovating at Petrochem. We've had great brainstorming sessions. We have, we have had a 2015 plan in 20, 2003. We've had a 2020 plan in 2015. And right now, in 2017, we're talking about 2025 plan. So I think that... I think that we are sitting at the edge of our seat and I tell my people that if you are comfortable, you're going to relax and you're going to go to sleep. If you sit at the edge of your seat, you're going to perform and you're going to beat competition. Beating competition, staying ahead of competition means you're staying ahead of your game. And if you're not ahead of your game, you're going to be left behind and hence speed is of great consequence in business. Speed to innovate, speed to be ahead, speed to deliver, speed to perform. These are very, very important factors in our business. You're talking about long-term planning. Um, there's a, a well-known statistic that by the year 2025, 75% of the companies in the S&P 500 will not exist. And 50% of the companies that will replace the 75% of the companies that have gone down haven't been born today. So therefore, you will have a complete new set of competitors and a complete new set of companies engaging with you when you, by definition, in terms of this proxy, as a, uh, the statistic as a proxy, a 25% chance of survival. Yes. Yeah, you know, um, at this time, being a very, very mature company, the statistics are against us. Yeah. Uh, we may not outlive our competition, but that's the challenge. And, and hence, what we've done at Petrochem is we've invited the young, the youth, the energetic, the new blood. We've got new people in our company. New doesn't necessarily mean uh, new older people or new doesn't mean younger people only. But I mean new blood, new energy, new thought, new schools of thought. Um, they're, they're, we have done business differently since the last three years. And I know that we'll do business differently in the coming three years. At this point, we are not looking at five or 10 or 15 year cycles. We are looking at three year cycles. And the three year cycles then become a one year cycle and it becomes a quarterly target. And because the landscape is changing and it's changing very, very quickly, we have to adapt also very, very quickly. And we have, to, uh, we have done that. Uh, mind you, there's not been success in every new thing that we have done. We've fallen flat. We failed miserably in, miserably in lots of our initiatives, new initiatives. And sometimes we feel that the old is better than the new, but not really. The new will outclass the old, and I, I am very sure of that. As we look into the future of Petrochem Yogi, we have a lot of challenges, like you said, a lot of opportunities, like we shared. Um, what are the two or three specific things that you might be considering or doing 
to actually win in the future? Well, at first, um, I want my people to agree that the good times have gone. And, and that's a very strong statement. I, I say to my people, the good times have gone. If you don't work hard from now onwards, um, you are not going to survive. And I'm telling you, the business of Petrochem will need innovation, new blood, new strength. Otherwise, it will not survive. So I'm very serious about that. It's, I'm, not pessimistic. I'm not pessimistic about it. I'm realistic about it. That we will have to change the way we do business. We will have to do business in a manner that the new world accepts it. And the new world is full of technology, it's full of unknown. It's, um, as you said, that the competition that we will have five years from now is not even born yet. So we will need really special skill sets to overcome such challenges. But, you know, as long as we know that this is what's going to happen, we will, in this journey, find out new ways to combat um, those challenges and to hopefully survive the game. What is your view on mentoring? Well, it's very important to mentor. Um, I, I felt a lack of mentoring in my younger age, and I was looking for good mentors, and uh, I somehow suffered. A lot of my downhill and lot, lots of my downsides and, and, and my, my terrible time came because of lack of mentoring. I, I personally feel that it's very important to have a mentor. And there are lots of mentors. You can find a mentor in your gardener. You can find a mentor in your brother, in your father, in your friend. Uh, in your girlfriend, I mean, you, your mind and yourself needs to be open. And you need to find a mentor that, who respects you, who loves you, who likes you at least, uh, otherwise it will not going to work. I think paid mentorship doesn't work. I think you have to find mentors in your society. The two types of mentoring, and I shall challenge you with that. One mentoring is people who are older and wiser than you. And the other one is reverse mentoring when you have the 19-year-old geek falling out of university and coming in effectively teaching you a new perspective. What is your view on young people mentoring you? Uh, <laughs> that's a new curveball you've thrown. I think, um, I think that young people, um, personally, I mean, my first reaction would be the young people can give you new ideas, but they cannot give you experience. Um, they cannot talk from experience, and hence they cannot give you the experience. Young people are sharper, they're energetic, and they may have brave new ideas. Some of them may be foolish, but some of them may be good. Um, I, what I would do is I would listen to the young, but really do my own. Um, I would listen to those people who have fresh ideas, but try and bring my maturity and mold those ideas into, into my, my mental frame. I think that a lot of it would, a lot of good ideas need to be censored today because Behind one successful Amazon, there are 350 million failed Amazons. So let's not get very, very uppity and, and brave about things because you might you know, turn up with your egg on your face. Yeah. One of the new social contracts and work contracts that ha are coming up, uh, that the average board member and, and senior chairman is around the age of 60. The average manager running the company is around the age of 40. And the average consumer and the largest consumer is around the age of 20. So you have a three generational gap and you're trying to bridge that. The 60 year old deciding for the 20 year old run by the 40 year old. How do you see this dynamic coming together? And what are you doing as a great chairman, as a great uh, CEO uh, to look for after the 20 year old and the 40 year old at the same time? You know, as a CEO, I now want to be a general. I don't want to be a foot soldier. Um, foot soldiers are for the younger, more energetic, more brave uh, people and more foolish people. You know, a lot of, lot of energy these young people have. Some of it makes them do foolish things. And, and there's no harm in that. There's no harm in failing. There's no harm in making foolish decisions because you learn from that. Um, I think that my personally as a CEO, I would now like to be in boardrooms. I'd now like to be in glass houses and give advice and give mature advice yes. and leave these young people to do what they can. Also listen to them when they come up with brave ideas, temper those ideas and let them lose in the battlefield and I'm sure that they will win. When you close your eyes these days and relax, when you're listening to music, which I know you absolutely love, where does your emotion and where does your mind take you? What's that journey today in your life? Well, I think, um, I think that at my age, I feel that um, a lot has been done and some little still needs to be done. And that some little is, 
I'm very keen to achieve that some little because now I'm not under any financial pressure. Uh, I want to enjoy those remaining, let's call them 20 years of my life, uh, giving more, uh, giving, giving good advice, giving back to society, uh, living the life on my own terms is very important for me now to live life on my own terms, share, share family time, um, you know, and things that I never did, I missed out trying to make a career, trying to achieve. Uh, I want to go back uh, to my own soul, to my own self, to my own family, and sort of unwind and retire gracefully.